Readings this morning in Jesus' precious name. Blessing to worship the Lord today. It's a blessing to study around his word. and Also the meditational this morning, Brother Devon shared that if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. It was again rehearsed in Sunday school. The same thought. If you love me, keep my commandments. The Bible also says that no man can hate his brother and say that he loves God. If you love me, love one another. Another sign that we love God. May God help us to truly experience the love of God in our hearts so that that love can be shed abroad in our hearts to those we meet. What greater witness as we had in Sunday school than the love of God? I believe the world recognizes a people that have a love for God and for each other. Something the world knows little of. This morning for a message, I've simply entitled it, How to Pray. Do you all know how to pray? The disciples came to Jesus and said what? Teach us to pray. The disciples with Jesus asked him how to pray? I'd like to look at a few verses first. We will be turning to Matthew 6, verse 5. But in, as you can turn to there, I'd like to read a couple other verses. In Romans 8, verse 26, it says, Likewise, the Spirit helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And... We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. There's a couple things that stand out to me in that scripture. It speaks about we know not what we should pray for as we ought. Have you all experienced that? Have you ever got to the point where you really didn't know for sure how you should pray for this situation? Why? Part of it, I believe, is simply because we do not know the will of the Father. But, second point in what we read is simply that the Spirit maketh intercessions for us. Now, what is that Spirit? It is this referring to the Spirit of God. How can we have the Spirit of God? Does God pour His Spirit on all people? No. It's to those who have been born again. It's to those who have made that commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ to serve Him and invited the Holy Spirit to dwell in our hearts. Then we have the Holy Spirit that can make intercession with God beyond what we're able to make words for. What a blessing. I believe sometimes a quiet time of meditation is as much of a prayer than the actual words that we are speaking. Because when, when the Spirit maketh intercession for, for our groanings which cannot be uttered, God can take like, like a little girl that was, that was saying her bedtime prayers and she was saying the ABCs. And her mama said, well, why do you say the ABCs for your prayer? She said, well, I know that God can take 
and make the words whatever he wants. You know, that's kind of the way we feel ourselves sometimes. We're not sure how we should pray. But we know that when we have the Spirit of God within us, and we have a broken and a contrite spirit that has the motive of verse 28 that I read, that we know that all things will work together for good to those who love God. Really? Do all things actually work together for good? It depends how great your God is. It depends if we are trusting in the Almighty God or trusting in the God of self. There are some things that will bar our prayers to God. There are some things that we will, can make a choice for that God will not hear our prayers. In Psalm 68, 8, 66, 18, it says, For if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. If I have a sin in my life that I am unwilling to confess and forsake, God does not hear my prayer. Now, having said that, he does hear, hear the sinner's prayer of repentance. But a sinner, that's the only prayer that God hears. Is a, is a sinner's prayer of repentance and contrite pouring his heart out to God. There's another thing that bars our prayers from being answered by God. And in Proverbs 21, verse 13, we read that where it says, Whoso stoppeth his ears at the cry of the poor, he shall cry himself and shall not be heard. If we refuse to help those in need, those who are suffering, and if we shut up our bowels of compassion from him, it says, how dwelleth the love of God in the hearts? And if the love of God does not dwell in my heart, my prayers will only go to the ceiling. God does not hear our prayers when we have no compassion for the poor. Proverbs 28, verse 9 says, He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. If we turn away our ears from the word of God, if we read the word of God, and the word of God speaks to us, and it shows us something that is not right, and we go our own way and we forget, being a forgetful hearer and not a doer of the word, our prayers will not be heard. And even not be heard, it goes beyond that. It says it's an abomination before God. An abomination is something that is ugly. God looks at it as disdainful. Why? Because we have an air of being right with God and having a fellowship with God when we directly disobey his word. There are so many people today, and that was alluded to in Devon's meditation as well. Those that say, Lord, Lord. And have a great glowing testimony, yet do not do the will of the Father. I believe that's what Devon was referring to this morning. Those prayers are not just heard, are just not just not heard, but are an abomination. And also in John 9 31 it says, For we, we know that God heareth not sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Praise God. When we love him and we keep his commandments and we are his child, he doth hear us. Have you ever wondered, well, does God even hear my prayer? It seems he's not doing anything about all my requests. It seems God isn't answering. Where is God? We are a worshiper of God, and we are in his will. We have the promise of Jesus right here that says, He heareth us. Thank God. And now, in Matthew 6, beginning of verse 5, And when thou prayest, 
Thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, when thou shut thy door, pray to the Father which, seeth, which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. Oh, your Father knoweth what need ye have before you ask him. So that means we don't have to ask the Father for anything. That means that forget about telling him our needs, because he knows what we have need of before we even ask. No, that's not what he's trying to say here. But what a blessing it is that he even knows what we're going to pray for. He even knows before we do what our needs are going to be. So why not trust him? Why not bring our petitions to him? So it says, don't be as the hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogues in the corners of the streets. Why? To be seen of men. My dear friends, if our prayers to God are for self-recognition, they won't go higher than the ceiling as well. And may I say, they will not be a blessing for anyone. I believe that's one of the dangers that we face in public praying. We don't want to pray in a way that is fumbling and mumbling and be an embarrassment to us, right? I bet there's none of us. I know I battle with that. There's none of us that want to have a public prayer that people go, my, he couldn't keep his mind together. But, when that takes preeminence and I'm trying to map out my prayer beforehand so that I can have a glowing prayer, it's not from the heart and it's not sincere. It speaks here of vain repetitions. What about a prayer book? Should we use a prayer book? Well, I'm not going to be judgmental over those that do. But I guess I question the sincerity when we use a book to read our prayers to Almighty God. Even though that I would say that there's probably some of those that have God-felt sincere prayers when reading out of a book. But I believe there's something that God sees more precious to him than the reading of a book. And that is a heart that is in tune with him that wants to just commune with him in a real way. Without pretense or form. The bottom line is that our prayers to Almighty God must be recognized as a wonderful blessing that we as God's people experience and it is not for show. It is not for self-esteem. It is not for self-prestige. So it says, go into thy closet and when thou shut the door, pray. Why is a closet a necessity? Or you might say in private. I don't think it simply means that you got to go into your clothes closet and shut the door and sit on a chair in there. That's not what he's trying to say, but he's trying to say take time alone with God. Spend time alone with God. Why? So that you're undisturbed from other things and other people. So that you can stay tuned to your personal worship. Enter your closet, shut your door, get alone, undisturbed, avoid interruptions and disturbance. 
But recognize it is also not for public impression. We don't go to our closet and post our prayer service in our closet on YouTube. Or go tell our family how long we were praying this morning. It is our time alone with God. Mark 1 35 it says, And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. That was Jesus. Jesus went out to a solitary place to pray. Also in Mark 6 46, and he sent them away and departed to the mountain to pray. Luke 6 12, they came to pass and went up in the mountain to pray and continued there all night to prayer to, in prayer to God. And even in the Garden of Gethsemane, says what it says and he went for about a stone's cast from the others all alone and prayed Peter says on the morrow as they went on their journey he drew nigh into the city Peter went up into the housetop to pray about the sixth hour why did he go to the housetop to get away from the commotion to get away from people get up and be alone commune with God God knows and hears all our prayers when we are sincere there are rewards to prayer in ephesians 3 20 it says now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us imagine that we'll have a little bit more about that hopefully at the close of the message thinking about Able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Do we recognize God with that much power? That he can do way more than we even think. Right now, my wife's mother is sick in the hospital. And the doctors say there's no hope. She's on going to be sent home they advised a different word but it means hospice care so in the world's view it's hopeless and then last night one of the children mentioned on the group that mom's had a, such a good day maybe God is healing her Really? You know where my mind wanted to go? Come on. The doctor said there's no hope. How much faith? How much faith? He can do exceedingly abundant above all that we ask or think. Sometimes I get a hard time wrapping my mind around that God really could take those three brain tumors and make them go away, go away. Three brain tumors, plus cancer in the stomach. It's hopeless in human reasoning. But he can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Now, how about hijacking that? So he's going to. If I have enough faith, Mom's going to be healed. True? Can I manipulate God? I don't know the will of God. But I know that He can. That's where God wants us. He wants us to know that His power is invincible. And if he wants to do it, he can. The other thing that we know is true, and that is that his grace is sufficient. When the doctors mention that just, yeah, probably take her home, just make her as comfortable as you can. She looked at one of the daughters that was sitting there 
and just smiled. How? How can you smile when the doctor's saying go home and get ready to die? Because of the peace of God, which passes to all understanding, which will keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. It's because his grace is sufficient to meet our every need. It is because of her faith in Almighty God. That's how. Unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly. My dear friends, that is a, a, a must for us to believe that our God can when we pray. If we come and we pray before God doubting. If we don't think God really could, why do we pray? We must come before him in true faith, recognizing that he has the power over all things. Also, he meets our needs day by day. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We must recognize that Jesus has the means of supplying our needs. Almost also, we must believe that he gives us victory over temptation or trial. And we could read the verse in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There are no temptation taken you, but such is this common demand. God is faithful, not suffer to be tempted above that ye are able. But will with the temptation make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. It's a promise in, the will of, in, in God, of God, to meet our needs, to bear us through. And also in Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Notice we had talked about that a little earlier. Does God want us to hear our test? He knows what we need before we ask. But here it says that we are to make our requests known before God. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I had referred to that verse earlier. Let your requests be made known unto God. Prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving. How can we have thanksgiving when God doesn't answer the way we think he should? Have you ever struggled with that? Thanking God for the way he answered our prayer when it was exactly opposite what we were praying for? When we have faith in God, we are able to thank him when he answers opposite to our plea. That's not easy to do on the human level. But when we have a true faith in God, we can. Just one more note. So who can pray that God hears? We already alluded to that, those who are right with God, those who have the Spirit of God dwelling in their hearts. So my question was, does God hear a child's prayer? Does God hear a child's prayer? I believe he does. A child in its innocence can pray to God. There's a verse, several verses in Genesis 21. That bring this out in verse 14 through 17. It says, And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. Here she was out in the wilderness with her, with her child. All alone, sent away from home. There was strife between the two, Abraham's two wives. And Hagar was sent out with her child. And finally, they had no more water, they were thirsty, they were hungry, and she put the little child under a bush to die. And it says in verse 17, and God heard what? The voice of Hagar. No, the voice of the lad. And then the angel of God called to Hagar and said, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad. And he met their needs. 
God hears and knows a child's prayer. We read that verse about, for they, that th they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Long public prayers. Is that fitting? Did Jesus make long public prayers? Anybody know what the longest prayer is recorded of Jesus? The Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is the longest recorded prayer of Jesus. So, just have a note that I'll read here. It says, I think we can learn a lesson here. Our master's prayers were short when offered in public. But when he was alone with God, it was different. He could spend the whole night in communion with his Father. Those who pray most in their closets generally make short prayers in public. Long prayers are too often not prayers at all. And they come from those who don't pray in their closets. I don't know. That's not Bible. And I'm not here to condemn those who have longer prayers than others. But I don't believe that public prayers should be long-winded. Why? Because it tends to become more of a show than a true heartfelt prayer. In prayer, it is better to have a heart without words than words without heart. Productive prayer requires earnestness, not eloquence. The other thing that we need to remember when we pray in public is it's not about me. When we pray in public, we shouldn't be praying, I thank you, God, and I say this, and I say plead for that. We need to look at it that we're publicly praying, and it's our petition. It's our prayer. It's our plea. And then when we pray in private, we can pray singularly. Let's remember, public prayers are representing the group. Going on here in Matthew 6, After this manner pray ye. Jesus' words here saying, After this manner pray ye. He's saying, here's the template. I'm going to give you a template to pattern after. These are the things that are vital when you come to prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, our Father. Notice that. Our is plural. It's not just my Father. It's your Father. It's our Father. We're a part of a bigger body. It's not just me and God. Today the cry is, as long as it's right between me and God, we don't need the body. We don't want, need anybody else judging my life. It's just me and God. Well, the prayer starts in with our Father. We're together. Lord, we thank you that you are our Father. Our Father recognizes his authority. When we recognize someone as our Father, we recognize someone that has authority over us. So we want to recognize that when we pray to him, we're recognizing him as our authority. And that we are in submission to his rule. Our Father. And like I already alluded to, thank you, Father, that we can be a part of your family. Our Father. How 
How does God look at us when we call him our father? In Matthew 7, 11, it says, If you then, being evil, know how to give, give, give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? When God sees us in contrition, asking him as our Father, as having full authority over my life, and we bring our petitions to him, he loves to bless his children. There's not a one of us as fathers that doesn't love to do good to our family. We love to be a blessing to our children, to our wives, and to our families. We even find it enjoyable when they ask us for counsel, don't we? It's kind of interesting now that we have two married sons. And the phone rings and they say, Dad, what do you think about this? Dad, what do you think? Should I do this or should I do that? And it's a little amusing to me because they used to have all the answers. But I enjoy that. How much more does our Father in Heaven enjoy it when we recognize that, God, I'm just not sure what I should do, but I need your help. I need your guidance. Our Father which art in heaven. Which art in heaven. We're not talking about our earthly father. We're not talking about the father priest. And we're not talking about the father of lies. We're talking about our father in heaven. My dear friends, there's only one father in heaven. So we're recognizing him as the only it's not our fathers either. There's only one. I am that I am. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed. It means to be sacred, revered, and respected. Lord, we respect your hallowed name. When we respect and we revere something, we honor it to the point of worship. So we worship God our Father and we hallow his name when we come before him in prayer. He is God and he is to be respected and honored even when he answers our prayers opposite of what we desire. Isaiah 55 verse 8 for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my, your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heaven is higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. That's how great God is. Are we tempted to belittle or to criticize God when he answers opposite of what we pray? I trust not. If we hallow his name, if we revere and worship his name, then we accept his will for our lives. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. What does that mean? Well, God has a kingdom of, in heaven, right? That's his kingdom. That's his domain. That's where he's reigning and ruling right now. God is in heaven and his kingdom is on the throne. He is on the throne of his kingdom, I should say. King of kings and Lord of lords. In heaven supreme, the kingdom of God. What's there? Peace, joy, love, light. And the list could go on. There's no sin, no evil. Everything is pure and holy. So why does he say, thy kingdom come? I believe it simply means that as it is in heaven, O Lord, help us to represent your kingdom on earth as well. Thy kingdom come and dwell within our hearts and lives. Thy kingdom come and rule and reign. Thy kingdom come. We are the temple of the living God. And he wants to reign within our hearts and lives. Thy kingdom come into our hearts, into our lives. Acts 17, 24, God that made the world 
and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth. His kingdom is on earth as well, living and dwelling in the hearts of his people. He dwelleth not in temples made with hands. John 18, 36, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then will my servants fight. Revelation 21, 3, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. That is the kingdom coming to earth. That is the kingdom ruling and reigning here and now. The almighty kingdom, the unvanquished kingdom, the kingdom that will stand forever dwells within our hearts. We sang that song, 105 this morning, Eternal Father. And verse 3 and 4 it says, And thou great spirit in my heart dost make thy temple day by day. The Holy Ghost of God thou art yet dwellest in this house of clay. Blessed Trinity in whom alone all things created move or rest. High in the heavens thou hast thy throne. Thou hast thy throne within my breast. I marveled at how that song brought that very thought out. The temple of God, the kingdom of God, let thy kingdom come and dwell within our hearts that we can be a representation of the heavenly kingdom of God here on earth. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. You know, that is often the hardest part of this prayer. Thy will be done. But God, please. But God, why? But God, how? Thy will be done. Speaks of a broken and a contrite heart before God that we recognize that what God does is right. Just as God is in control of heaven, it says sin can never enter there. God is in control. He's just as much in control here. But the difference is that on this side of eternity, we have a choice. And it's because of man's choice that the world is so evil. Because man chooses to go away from God. But God is still in control. God is in control of heaven and earth. We aren't. What about the weather? Can you control that? What about our health? Can you control that? What about our looks? We don't have a whole lot of say to it, do we? What about having the government do as they should? How much control? It's out of our power. We're helpless. What about God? He's all powerful. He can do it all. He can make it rain whenever he wants to. He can make it be dry whenever he wants to. He can make us look like a, whatever he wants to. He can make us healthy. He can make us sick. And it says the king's heart is in his hand. He can do it all. We can. But when we pray to him and we commit it to him, we're committing it to the king of kings and lord of lords who can do it. If it is his will. And this is the confidence that we have in him in 1 John 5, 14. If any man ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we desired of him. Dissecting that a little bit. We have confidence in him that if we ask it according to his will, we know that what we get is exactly what he desired. So, how about, we know that there are some things that are unquestionably the will of God. 
It is not his will that any perish, but that all should come to repentance. So why, when we pray and we pray for the salvation of this young man or brother or sister, or whoever it might be, why is there no fruit? Because what I already alluded to, man still has the choice. But we don't pray. Lord, if it is your will, we pray that you would convict the lost sinner. We don't pray that because we know it is his will. All things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. Whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified. If any man shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. That's where it comes. We must interpret scripture with scripture, like we heard this morning. Some people will take those verses and hijack them. You know, there's a verse that says that ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lusts. You know, we are so prone to praying for things that God does not want us to have because we're inclined to ask for things that we want on the natural side rather than whatever God wants. Now having said that, I don't believe it is wrong for us to pray for natural things. And we'll actually get to some of that if I get moving on fast enough. Give us this day our daily bread. That is a request for natural things. I believe it can also relate to spiritual things. That God would give us the daily bread of his word. But I believe that God also wants us to realize that our dependency on natural things is also from him. Because the health to work and the blessing of, of being able to supply our needs comes from God. I believe we should be asking God to bless our business. I believe we should be asking God for wisdom how to direct our business in natural things. But not that we may consume it upon our lust. That's the difference. Does God always answer prayers of faith? He always answers, but not always in the way we want. David was a man after God's own heart. And his prayer was not answered as he desired. He had prayed that his, that child would not die and went in and lay all night upon the earth. But on the seventh day of him praying and pleading to God, the child died. Did God not hear David? Yes, he did, but it was not his will. Paul, his prayer was not answered. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. The messenger saved Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing, he says, I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, what? You're healed. My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Because I can take those eyes that can hardly see. And I can bring glory to myself. Paul was one in relief. God said, I'll take care of you. Prayer is not a way of getting what we want, but the way to become what God wants us to be. Did you get that? Prayer is not a way of getting what we want, but the way to become what God wants us to be.
Give us this day our daily bread. I already alluded to that. Trust God for what we need. Charge them that are rich in this world that be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. We must recognize God as the giver of all good things. Thank God for his blessings and pray for his continued supply. Fanny Crosby, though blinded in infancy, greeted friends and strangers alike with a cheerful, God bless you, dear soul. And according to her own statement, she never attempted to write a hymn without first kneeling in prayer. If this be true, Fanny Crosby spent considerable time on her knees. She wrote over 8,000 songs. Miss Crosby was often under pressure to meet deadlines. It was under such circumstances in 1869 that she tried to write words for a tune composer W.H. Doan had sent her, but she couldn't write. Then she remembered she had forgotten her prayer. Rising from her knees, she dedicated, as fast as her assistant could write, words for the famous hymn, Jesus Keep Me Near the Cross. <coughs> but one day in 1874, Fanny Crosby prayed for more material things. She had run short of money and needed five dollars, even change. There was no time to draw on her publishers, so she simply prayed for the money. Her prayer ended. She was walking to and fro in her room trying to get into the mood for another hymn when an admirer called. Greetings, the stranger said. God bless your dear soul, she replied. The two chatted briefly. In the parting handshake, the caller left something in the hymn writer's hand. It was a five dollars rising from the prayer of thanks. The blind poet wrote, All the way my Savior leads me. What have I to ask beside? Can I doubt his tender mercies? Who through life has been my guide? Heavenly peace, divinest comfort. I can't get it all. Here, notice the resignation and the trust in God. When God answers prayers, it increases our trust. But we must always recognize that God does answer our prayers, even when sometimes it seems he doesn't. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Pretty simple. We must recognize that when we pray that prayer, we are either being granted a gift from God or we are damning our own selves. It's one or the other. If I am forgiving my fellow man as I should, my God is forgiving me. But when I am not forgiving my fellow man as I should, it means I'm bringing condemnation on myself. Because I'm asking God to forgive me just the way I forgive others. God help us that we can remember that. That we forgive readily others their trespasses. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Satan the tempter is all around us. Now we know that Jesus does not tempt us, and yet he allows the tempter to tempt us. And we're asking to shield us from the evil one that would tempt us and draw us away from him. We must recognize always that we are prone to wander. We are prone to leave the God we love. We are prone to deception. Lord, lead me not in temptation, but deliver me from evil. Help me, Lord, to be faithful and true to thee. <clears throat> Hebrews 4.15, For we have not an high priest which cannot be, cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He knows every temptation you face. He knows every trial you face. He knows all your disturbing factors that come in circumstances that come into your life. He's met them all himself. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may be obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That is our God. That is Jesus right now interceding at the Father's right hand for you and I. That we can obtain grace and to find help in time of need. That we can be victorious in our Christian life and that we can be victorious in our journey to heaven. Too often, 
we don't avail, don't avail ourselves in the bountiful grace available to us. What would you think of a man that had a million dollars in the bank and only drew out a penny a day? The throne of grace is established. There we are to get all the grace we need. Sin is not so strong as the arm of God. He will help and deliver you if you come and get all the grace you need. He has all we need. And too often we're just taking out a penny. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to preserve the unjust in the day of judgment to be punished. For thine is the kingdom. Yours is the kingdom of heaven and earth. Recognizing you as a creator and sustainer. Father, yours is the kingdom, the right to rule and reign. It is your kingdom, Lord, it's not mine. As you will, not mine. For thine is the kingdom and the power. There's no greater power, there's no greater force than the power of God. You have the right to rule with your power and to govern my life. All the inhabitants of the earth are repeated as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? Isaiah 43, 13, Yet before the day was, I am he. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? That's God. All power. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Yours is the glory, O oh God. All glory belongs to you. It is magnificent, full of splendor. You alone are worthy of admiration. You alone are worthy for all that is good to receive credit. We're dust of the earth. And all that we have was given of God. We have nothing to glory in of ourselves, but all glory to God. For how long? Forever. It begins now, and it will culminate in eternal glory in heaven. Without end, Amen. What does amen mean? Let it be so. That is a culmination again of the surrender to your will. Let it be according to your will. I agree, Lord, that you have control. And even though we prayed our prayers and our pleas, finally, Lord, it's all yours. Do as pleaseth thee. Shall we kneel for prayer? Dear Lord, we thank you again for your many blessings to us this day. Lord, above all, we thank you for the gift of salvation we have through Jesus, who gave his life on the cross, shedding his precious blood for our sins. But Lord, we are thankful that even though he died, that he rose again and is interceding now for us at your right hand. Lord, we thank you that you've given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Thank you, Lord, that you have not left us forsaken or your seed begging bread. Lord, you have met our needs. And Lord, we thank you that all that you do is right and good. And Lord, today, we just ask that you would have your will and way in each one of our hearts and lives. Forgive us for we have come short of allowing you to have your will and way in our hearts and lives, that we have resisted you, or Lord, that we have tried to manipulate you. Lord, help us to trust in you and to pray and, and to bring our supplications before you, but to always pray according to your holy will. For Lord, with you is all power and all might. We commit our lives into your hand. In Jesus we pray. Amen.
I'd like to open up for testimony at this time.